Hi, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You're listening to Living the Wildlife, discussing all things related to vertebrate pest control as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, hope you had a great week. Hope things are going well for you. Uh, I have been uh, busier than uh, I'm starting to wear out a little bit. So uh, traveling and uh, with speaking engagements, of course, I've already mentioned in the past. I also have uh, another trip <clears throat> lined up that I wasn't originally uh, planning on, but uh, it'll be good. So nevertheless, uh, and then some personal work with the business is certainly beginning to grow more so uh, tough time of the year for me as I'm in my day job of course and as well as my uh, business so when things are coalescing it can be kind of a tough period but nevertheless it's uh it it has been it has been good we're glad to have you here uh if you're wondering what this is this is living the wildlife we are a podcast that delves into the details of vertebrate pest control we get geeky with it because we are part of the pest geek podcast family so if you're interested in all things related to the control of vertebrate pests whether they be commensal rodents or raccoons or skunks or beaver or other things we are interested in those topics uh, for the particularly the professional wildlife control operator or pest control operator or if you're just a just a member of the general public we're glad to have you on board as well so do take a few moments if you would to subscribe to the channel Uh, definitely ring the bell so you can be updated by future editions I tend to publish once a week if you want to get me directly you can reach me at of course rumble just go to wildlife control consultant and subscribe to my podcast there i post my material there or you can get it through youtube when it's posted as part of the pest geek podcast family uh comments criticisms suggestions for new shows perhaps you'd like to be on the show you can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com gmail.com. All right, well, this week I uh, thought I would talk about cocalciferol. Let me uh, pull up my PowerPoint here. And uh, it is a, as some of you would know, uh, it is considered to be an organic rodenticide, and I would put that probably in quotes, organic, in the sense that it is... uh, it is not a product that is just simply manufactured by humanity. It's a it's a chemical that is natural. It's a vitamin D3. Those of you, if you take vitamin D, it, this is the rodenticide, right? But it's obviously, it's not killing us because, as you all know, the dose makes the poison. But this is a particular product used in the control of commensal rodents. And so... Uh, we're going to do a sort of a deep dive on this particular active ingredient as it relates to house mice. And the study was done by a person named uh, Nolan, that's his last name, L-O-A-N, and he published his dissertation in 2018. And the title of his dissertation was Impacts of Two Temporal Rotations from a Non-Toxic Bait to a Cocalciferol Rodenticide on wild house mouse, mus musculus, that's from Leno, consumption, bait station interaction, and movements. And he got a PhD from Clemson University. And so there's the cover page of his dissertation there. So the information I am summarizing for you here comes from his dissertation. I might get a couple of podcasts out of this because he did some really interesting things 
and uh, we're grateful for his work here, but I want to be sure to give him credit. This is not my material, right? I'm basically someone who is sort of going to try to popularize this a little bit more, get some of this information out, because too often the hard work of these researchers doesn't reach the field, and it's sad, and that's a marketing problem, and that's kind of where I step in. I want to try to gather some of this information, say, hey, this is important, this is what it means, this is how you can apply this, fi these findings to your particular business. And cocalciferol was the product that he, that he studied dealing with house mice. I want to be very clear about that. We're not talking about deer mice, we're not talking about Norway rats or roof rats. This is strictly uh, in a house mouse situation. So where was this study done? Well, the study was done at an agricultural seed processing and storage warehouse. So there's a lot of competing food available, and that's simply important for you to realize. This is not someone's home where they were instructed, you know, make sure you clean up as much as possible. This is a difficult location because the mice have access to alternative food sources. And uh, you would talk about how there was different bags of grain that would be open from time to time. And so mice did have access to alternative food sources here. And then, you know, no matter how clean you are, there's always spillage, right, in these places. So it's not like this place was a dump. Don't want to give that impression, but it's not, you know, squeaky clean. It's not a, uh, a clean room in a... Uh, chip manufacturing, uh, you know, a computer chip manufacturing company, right? So it's not a clean room, right? So we're not dealing with that. So it's a it's a warehouse. It was an active warehouse that had longstanding uh, issues with house mice. That that would not be surprising because of its particular source. Steel walled building, and uh, it was located in Pickens County, South Carolina. So certainly a warm part of the country, to be sure. And the history there was is that the house mouse population was naive to cocalciferol. So that was important for you to realize. This is not a place where cocalciferol was used prior to his particular study. Now, there were other rodenticides used. And he talks about how there was low-level use of anticoagulants. However, during before he began his study, no rodenticides were used six months prior to the initiation of his study. So that's pretty long because typically a house mouse living in, in the wild, as this would be, uh, for a year would be remarkable, right? So there's the idea is that there's enough time going by that you're getting sort of a changeover of the rodent population is kind of the assumption here. And I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption. Well, here's a picture of, or line drawing, I should say, of the particular site. And you can see the scale down below and that little bar there shows out 10 meters. So that's over 30 feet, right? So it's, so it's a pretty big building. And those little black boxes that you see against the wall of the structure and around some of the internal rooms, those were where the bait stations were placed. And the bait station he used was the Aegis RP, which is produced by Leafatech. And he, the non-toxic bait that was part of the study was he was using DTEX, that was from Bell Labs, and he chose that because it was very similar in formulation and was, and was also created by the same company that made the cocalciferol product, which was specifically to rad three add blocks. So let me repeat that again because I mispronounced it. Terad 3 Ag Blocks. So he was using DTEX, non toxic bait, Terad 3 Ag Blocks for the toxic bait, all placed inside of Aegis RP bait stations produced by Leafatech. And so pretty rigorous uh, study exercise here. And so this is what he basically, the, the goals of his study were essentially as follows. He wanted to evaluate the house mouse consumption of cocalciferol compared to a non-toxic bait. And the first part of the study was, this was without prior exposure to cocalciferol. So how much do house mice consume 
of cocalciferol when they haven't had prior exposure to cocalciferol as compared to their consumption of a non-toxic bait? That's the first question. The second question was, is how much cocalciferol do the house mice eat when they've had prior exposure to cocalciferol when you compare that consumption with their consumption of a non-toxic bait. So the idea is how much do house mice eat of cocalciferol when they're naive to the product and how much do they eat of the product after they are no longer naive to the product. So that's the kind of the goal. You say, well, why would he be studying this? Well, he's trying to find out if there's going to be a uh, some fear or reticence of them going back to it. Are they getting conditioned aversion, which is a problem of if an animal has a bad experience with a product, if you re-expose the animal to the product, they often ignore it, right? This is one of the challenges with a product known as you know, an active ingredient called zinc phosphide. If an animal survives an exposure to zinc phosphide, they will often ignore bait treated with zinc phosphide later on if when they see it again you know it's just like how when was the last time you went to a a restaurant where previously you were throwing up after eating there well chances are you're not rushing to go back to that restaurant again you've had a bad experience and you're like i don't want that experience again well rodents are no different house mice are no different if they've had a bad experience with a product and survived they're not likely to go back again so he wants to find out do they become conditioned aversion? Do they develop conditioned aversion to it? And then how much, in the way to determine that is how much will they eat after exposure when you compare that consumption to non-toxic bait? So his findings were rather interesting here. So to just sort of summarize again, cocalciferol is considered an organic rodenticide. Now remember, when we talk about organic, that is a a kind of a legal or quasi-legal definition because there's an organization in the United States, like the USDA and other nonprofit organizations, that declare what constitutes organic farming. And so cocalciferol is one rodenticide, I think it's the only rodenticide that I'm aware of, at least at the present time, that is permitted for use in organic farms. And the reason is, is because it's vitamin D. So we think about cocal, we think about organic being more natural and it's, you know, the idea of it's safer. Now you can, I hope that you don't think it's always safer. What organic means is that it's kind of a philosophy that you're trying to work with nature better rather than fighting it, rather than using highly processed foods. You're trying to work with nature. And the idea here is that because vitamin D is a naturally occurring compound, Therefore, it becomes a organic in the sense of not the chemical that the chemistry definition of organic, which just means it has carbon in the in the molecule, but it's organic in the sense that it's natural. It's not a it's not a uh, constructed compound by human intervention. If that hope that helps. So how does it kill? Well, it frees up calcium in the bloodstream, causing calcification in major organs, ultimately leading to a heart attack. Now, when an animal begins to eat it, or specifically in this case, when house mice are eating it, they develop a stop feeding effect after one to three days of exposure. And so this is part of the challenge of is cocalciferol a single feed rodenticide or a multi feed rodenticide? It, it's a little bit of both, right? So it kind of depends, I guess, on how much the animal consumes, right? So uh, it could be a single feed or a multi feed. I think many people are treating it like a multi-feed that the animal has to feed a couple of times to get that toxic dose so but nevertheless when house mice feed on it when they reach sort of that critical mass for some reason they stop eating more of it so it has a stop feeding effect when they're exposed to products 
made with cocalciferol. Now, the LD50 for house mice is 42.5 milligrams per kilogram. That's kind of high when you compare it to other things like brodifacum, which is, I think, one or two milligrams per kilogram, right? So it's it takes a lot for the house mouse to eat in order to get a toxic dose. Now, what that means in reality for us in terms of bait consumption, because that's a formulated ingredient, right? When we talk about LD50, LD50 is often done on the basis of a pure product, right? The pure active ingredient. Well, how much does a mouse have to eat of the formulated product, the bait that you're putting into the bait station? How much of that do they have to eat to reach the LD50 level? And for a mouse, that's 1.13 grams of bait to reach the LD50 for a 20 gram mouse. Okay, so they've got to, you know, they've got to eat a fair, they've got to eat a fair amount, you know, for a mouse uh, in order to reach that LD50. So uh, about five, what's that? One uh, twentieth, what's that? Five, uh, five percent of its body weight, a little more than five percent of its body weight it has to uh, consume in order to reach the LD50. So it may take a couple of days, right? So the study that he did was he initially put out his bait stations. He wanted to get the rodents conditioned to their presence. So those were left out for 13 days. Then he put in the detox bait, which is the non-toxic bait, in those bait stations, and he left those in place for 19 days. Then he went through eight days when the bait stations were empty, and that moved into phase two, which is 21 days of applying the cocalciferol bait. Followed by eight days when the bait stations were empty, followed by 36 days of non-toxic bait, followed by two days of stations being empty, followed by then 27 days where cocalciferol was reintroduced to the population. And so during this time, he is obviously monitoring the consumption of bait. He's weighing how much bait is being applied, and he ultimately is doing some population studies. So he determined what was the population level of the house mice in that particular facility. And then, of course, that's pre-exposure, then after exposure to try to determine how, how effective was the cocalciferol in reducing house mouse populations. So that's kind of the timeline. So he started on April 8th, and the entire study was finished on August 20th. So he's picking the period of time when mice are often having a lot more young as well. So he's picking a pretty heavy duty period of time here, even if it's in the Carolinas. So here's what his findings were in terms of the average. That's what we mean by the mean. We don't mean mean as someone's angry with you, but the mean consumption means the average consumption. So notice how much consumption was made. This is by the way, per day. So what we had was over nine grams of non-toxic bait was being consumed each day on average before he used the cocalciferol. Once he applied the cocalciferol, notice how quickly, how low the consumption dropped to about one, less than one gram of bait per day. And the reason for that was the stop feeding aspect of cocalciferol. So you're using extraordinarily small amounts but we don't know how well it worked, right? So is it, are they just avoiding it because they don't like the taste or is it so good that they're eating it and they're dying so quickly, right? Notice when he reintroduces the non-toxic bait, consumption rises again. Well, that's not good news, right? That's suggestive that the population is not as low as the cocalciferol consumption would suggest. Then he reintroduces the cocalciferol again for the second time. And notice how consumption is even lower. It's down to probably a third of a gram per day, which is, uh, oh, probably, a th you know, well, it was about an 
one gram per day and now it's probably a third gram so it's dropped even more so clearly uh something's happening here now this is what it looks like over time when you're looking at it on a sort of a per day uh, graph notice that there's a tremendous amount of consumption of the non-toxic bait during the phase one period then it drops precipitously once the cocalciferol now is introduced and so that that's going to be suggestive of one of two things either that the cocalciferol is kicking the snot out of these out of these mice or for some reason they're avoiding it that they don't like the taste and this is where you get the idea that people think that cocalciferol has uh, some sort of a taste or a flavoring that's causing rodents not to consume it and and that's indicated or suggested i should say when you look at the non-toxic as soon as he switches over to non-toxic bait consumption rises not as high as it was initially because the population has clearly probably dropped at this point cocalciferol has clearly killed some we don't know how much yet because i haven't given you that information but we know the population isn't completely eliminated right because we can see that their feeding increases dramatically after the reintroduction of non-toxic bait then when he applies the non -tox the toxic bait on in phase four consumption drops then it rises slightly and around day 93 to 95 and then it really drops down to almost zero in the following days after that so that's kind of how it looks over time this is how you would experience it as a technician putting bait in your bait stations if you followed this particular pattern so what were the results of this information well what he found was after his initial 21-day application of cocalciferol, and that's in phase two, remember phase one was the non-toxic bait, phase two was the application of the toxic bait, he determined that the population of house mice in that facility dropped by 75%. So if you had 100 mice to begin with, you now have 25 mice. Good. That's good, but it's not great, right? I mean, how many of you have clients that want to have only 25% of the mice available that they had before? No, they're hiring you to eliminate the mice in that particular facility. He said that noted that stop feeding, the stop feeding effect of cocalciferol significantly reduced consumption after it was out in the bait stations for three days. So the mice had access to the bait. After three days, consumption dropped dramatically. But here's the kicker. Consumption was restored. That means consumption of cocalciferol was restored when there was a period of no bait and non-toxic baiting. Now, why is this important? What it means is, is that the rodents are not developing conditioned aversion to the bait. So the ones that survived are willing to go back and give cocalciferol a try if you give them a period of time. So what the idea being is if you're in a business and you're using cocalciferol and you are applying it for 21 days and you're feeling, I guess it's according to the label. I haven't seen if the label's changed or not, but this was the label that he had when he did his study, Mr. Nolan, Dr. Nolan now. Then you understand that you probably need to switch out your bait station to a non-toxic bait, get the mice feeding again, determine how many are left, then reintroduce the non the toxic bait again for that second punch or that second bite at the apple so to speak and when he did that the second baiting reduced the house mouse population down to three percent so he started with if he started with 100 his first baiting reduced the mouse population to 25 i'm just using 100 uh, using round numbers to just make this easy to show, right? It's a 75% reduction. Then he went to a non-toxic bait, followed by a second introduction of cocalciferol. That then reduced that 25 mice 
down to three. Which, so he ended the study with 97% level of control. But he had to have that break in the middle where you're not just constantly keeping that cocalciferol out there exposed to the rodents. So what this means for you if you're using cocalciferol and you're having, dealing with house mice, it's probably a good idea not to just simply try to keep it out there for months and months on end. You need to probably do that 21 days, followed by some non-toxic bait, monitor to see what kind of activity you're having, because you might be done. I mean, it's certainly possible. Remember, the situation he's using this in is a warehouse that's working with agricultural seed, right? So the, the mice had plenty of food. This is not your typical home, right? But when he switched to a non-toxic and then followed that up again with reintroduction of cocalciferol, he was able to really drop that population down to that 3% level, which, was out, which is outstanding uh, given uh, the conditions of that particular facility. Uh, and the and the difficulty it would be to control mice in that particular facility. That's pretty impressive, in my opinion. So, uh, cocalciferol doesn't appear to have condition diversion challenges. You just need to sort of give that give those mice a break, and then with with a non toxic bait, and then reintroduce it again, and you're going to have a second uh, strike at them with cocalciferol. So if you've been using cocalciferol and not have been happy with the results, try this rotation where it's rodenticide followed by non-toxic followed by rodenticide again and to, to see if that helps improve the levels of control that you have. And uh, would love to hear from you to see how what your experience is out in the field. You've been listening to Stephen Van Tassel. I'm the host of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Do hope you take a few moments to uh, subscribe to the channel and to reach out to me if you have questions, comments, criticisms. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you if, uh, if you have an idea for a show definitely pass along if there's a particular topic that you would like to have covered would love to hear from you as well so this has been living the wildlife why do we call it living the wildlife well because we want you to live the wildlife not be the wildlife take care everybody